Um, I'm going to pick it up now, um, uh, just before you um, left office as, as minister. So we know from uh, the papers and from, from other, here, uh, uh, other witnesses that the Health and Community Care Committee published its report on hepatitis C on the 3rd of October. And we don't need to go to that, but for the transcript, it's MACK. 301929 underscore 001. And we looked at that yesterday in the recommendation that they made for a payment scheme. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about events very soon before you left office. So um, it, it seems from the papers that you'd formed a view um, a, a matter of days before leaving office that you would reject that recommendation made by the committee and um, uh, look to appoint an expert group to look into the question generally a, a, about no-fault compensation and specifically in relation to those infected with hepatitis C from infected blood. Now, I, I asked Mr Chisholm yesterday about the decision that ultimately he made to uh, advise the Cabinet to reject that recommendation um, from the committee, and I'm not going to ask you questions about that because that was his decision, but... Um, I just wanted to try and understand um, from you why you had suggested, why you thought that commissioning an expert group to look at this question of compensation was, was the way to go. I wondered if you want to bring a paper up on that. Absolutely. No, you just to I can do. It's, um, it's, uh, it's SCGV uh, 40247 underscore zero three zero uh, and just so that we can understand uh, if we go to page two of, uh, page two of that document okay can we see the document first yes it starts on page two that's page one if we go to page two we can see it's it's this is a draft draft two 22nd of November 2001 from you to the First Minister, and we can see the purpose to seek agreement to the Scottish Executive's formal response on the recommendations made in the Health and Community Care Committee. So just to put this in context, we looked yesterday with Mr Chisholm at this minute that had been developed um, and that he ended up submitting to the Cabinet for decision. So this appears to be a draft drafted during your time uh, 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 and then developed during his time. And the bit that I um, uh, would draw your attention to on this question is at page four. Um, so, in fact, if we just go back to page three, we can see that the relevant heading. Uh, it says discussion and then support for hep C sufferers. And then if we go over to page four, uh, the following page to paragraphs 14 and 17 are the relevant paragraphs. 14, our proposed response to the committee therefore rejects these recommendations that propose financial and practical support for all people who have contracted Hep C from NHS Scotland blood. Instead, it offers to set up an expert group to examine the whether the general principle of offering such support is A, right, B, practicable, and if so, what universal criteria could be applied. Um, and then you um, uh, go down at 17, established commission to examine system of negligence and fault-based compensation. The response to the committee falls slightly short of their recommendation. It offers to look at the issue for all health comes rather than just for blood and blood products. Also, the proposed review of the issue could conclude that the general principle was unsound or impracticable. In that case, the review would not progress to the detail of when and how compensation should be awarded. Nevertheless, the establishment of a review group would represent a significant gesture by the executive. So the question is, um, why had you suggested going down this route of commissioning uh, an expert group? So on the point about an expert group, um, and even if I were looking at this cold, if you put the papers in front of me from all that time ago, the absolutely sensible next step, I think, would have been that. Um, because 
what had been set out as a direction of travel and an intent on the part of the committee would have had to have been translated into some workable proposition with a proper framework around it. So, so actually, the idea of setting up a group, to me, as I say, just logically feels like the right way to progress an issue. If I could, though, I'd like to just understand a bit better something about some of these papers, because I've been confused by this. Um, as you say, this was just a few days before I left office. And in that period there, um, and now this is a year on from the point in time we were talking about before when the executive review was published. But at this point, we were by then having another leadership contest for another new first minister under very different circumstances. And my recollection is that it was earlier that month the previous First Minister had resigned, and it was that very same week that the dates in question here came... Sorry, it was that very same week as the dates in question here where that transition of leadership was taking place. Now, my reason for asking about this is because I have no direct memory of what I did or didn't do in that period. I remember the committee report being published, I'm sure I would have been involved in discussions, and as I say, it makes sense to me even now that one of the actions to take forward would be to set something up in that kind of space. But of the papers there, and there was one in the 21st that you, you shared with me, which I think came up yesterday as well, a minute of the 21st, with a draft cabinet paper. Yes, uh, that is... Um, I th I believe that's the one we looked at yesterday with uh, Mr Chisholm. Uh, do you want to have a look at that? Yes, please. Thanks. SCGV uh, 40247. Uh, I know I've got the wrong... That is the wrong reference, because I'm just about to give you the reference for this one. I've noted down the wrong reference, so oh. um, I'm not sure what the, what the reference is. Um, if you just give me a second, I will be able to find it. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, uh, I don't think the 21st of November is the one that we looked at yesterday. I would be grateful check. if you could check that because I think Malcolm is ever referenced the, the 21st. Sorry, this is the, uh, so this is uh, a paper from the 22nd of November mm -hmm. we're looking at now. I'm not sure I've got a reference for a paper from the 21st of November. Do you, you, you think you've seen one from the 21st of November, do you? I would love to be able to reach from one files and then I, I could answer with, with absolute confidence, but I'm fairly certain on that detailed timeline there was a, there was a draft cabinet paper and the, the date of, of the covering note um, was the 21st. Yes, so... Well, so he he so said the 21st, I think. I think it's the 30th of November is the date that I was given. And yesterday. the reference is SCGV yes. four zeros. 247 underscore 002. Uh, sorry, so I th I th I th you're absolutely right. That's the, the document we looked at yesterday with Mr Chisholm. Uh, I think uh, it may be... Can we go to the, 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 the document? I have a, a note that he said it was the 21st November, but it wasn't, didn't, I think, correspond with what was on the document. Uh, it, can, can, we, can we go to the page one of the document we're currently looking at, please, Lawrence? So I think this might be the answer to uh, what Ms Deacon is saying. The covering email for this document, SCGV... Four zeros two four seven underscore zero three zero, which is the one we've been looking at from the twenty second of November. Page one. If we go to page one of that, it is this is the covering email. Is this what you're talking about? Twenty first of November, two thousand and one. 
Yes, yes. that, that, that so, is the team lead for me. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, I, yes. I started, yes. I think I got myself muddled up. So this is the covering email. This is the document we were looking at. This is the covering email dated the 21st of November. If we go over the page, we can see that the there's a draft dated the 22nd of November. Uh, and the document we looked at with Mr Chisholm is dated the 30th of November. And I think, could you go to the back of the document that we're currently on? So, Malcolm has responded to this in his capacity as then Deputy Minister for Health and Community Care. But I don't see any response from me. And I don't know, I'm not saying I didn't, I don't know what stage of drafting I did or didn't see or agree to, just as a matter of factual accuracy. Um, and what I do know, because I actually queried this in the documents, because I was, try I was trying to answer that question for myself about what, where I had, at what point I had left in the decision making, so that I would know for coming here. And um, when I, yeah, when I asked about that, one of the, one of the things that, that I also, I don't know if discovered is the right word, because maybe it's in, it's in the paper somewhere, but the, the submission deadline, if you go back, if you could please, the front the, page. If you go document, back to the first page. Yeah. The submission deadline was extended because of that change of leadership, of an entire change of First Minister, reshuffle of Cabinet, and so on. So, as I say, just, just for accuracy, and, and obviously if there's anything else in, the, in the, the inquiries papers and so on that answers that point, then you know, I'll be guided by that because I don't have that recollection. But I, I, I don't know and I would query how far things were signed off as such. And to be honest, by that stage, precisely because there was nobody apart from perhaps the incoming First Minister knew who was going to be in which cabinet positions after that, but we all knew there was going to be a new First Minister. So I think there was also a bit of a hiatus at that point to allow that then new cabinet to consider and, and draw breath. So to understand where, where, that, where that goes. So although your, is this, is this right? Although your name is on that draft paper, it, you don't re remember you, whether you were involved in that decision and you may not have been for the reasons that you've articulated. Well, th there's a difference between involvement, I guess, and, and sign-off. What I, I'm definitely placing a question mark over is just how far I was involved in signing anything off. Right. I may have been involved in offering comments of some sort either on general direction and or on wording of another draft, but at that point it's still a draft. Um, you, you've told us already, and we can see from the papers, <coughs> correspondence and discussions between yourself and various um, health ministers in the UK government, so there's a, various bits of correspondence between yourself and Lord Hunt, there's correspondence with yourself and Yvette Cooper, um, and um, uh, there's a record of a telephone call with, with John Hutton, and I'll read the references into the transcript in a moment, but uh, that, that, that all suggest that you saw the issue of a payment scheme for those that have been infected with hepatitis C from blood or blood products um, a, a, as a UK-wide issue. Can you just tell us why that is? Um, and it wasn't just the, a payment scheme, uh, the, and I may say that some of those the alluded to changes there in terms of subsequent developments came a little bit later um, from all this. So, that, so in my time and where I left off, what we were still all grappling with was wider policy and direction and exploration and that whole area of compensation, financial assistance and so on. Then it was later the expert group, you know, put definition around that and the rest for others to, to answer. But as far as the pe that, that general shared view, I would put it, because I don't think there was ever a point in time where, you know, there was all these ministers coming together saying, yes, let's do all this, this together. 
I think as in a number of other areas, actually, you know, I think there was an evolution of thinking that this is something that we need to work together on, just as there were issues around pay at that time, just as there were issues, you know, around oh different aspects of service development. Um, you know, the it, oh, and I've actually, I should have said this. You know, variant CGD actually was was probably one of the most important contemporary examples at that time of the need for cooperation, that just because you could do things separately didn't mean you should. And, it, and that was a shared view across the four nations. I mean, I think if you look at a lot of the earlier correspondence during my time, you'll see that the routinely there's a lot of communication that's shared between four ministers, not just two even. I think there was a particular axis between Scotland and the UK. And at that time, it was before anybody was comfortable talking about England in that context. Um, there was a particular access there because where, where we were in our thinking and discussion, and yes, some of the litigation issues and so on that were around, but it, it, it was an area that, that it made sense to, to try and move forward together on, that you could sh sh share more understanding. If there was going to be some kind of financial arrangement, you could try and work something out. And, and by the way, on the, the finances, and I have to say, Malcolm Chisholm has much more expertise on this very specific issue than, than me and probably most people, which is a, because of two policy issues he dealt with in his time. Um, well, one is my Deputy Minister and then subsequently this. But, and it's the interface between payments made under the devolved power and social security arrangements then. been some changes since in powers in more recent years. Um, so, and financial issues, you know, there was these interfaces that would need to be managed on litigation, as I, I, as I know you've looked at, even though something had been decided in court, the, in the English courts, that would be um, taken into account in terms of any decision here and so on. So there, there was a sense that that was the way that, that, that um, yeah, this was one of the areas that, that we should move forward together on, and the, not because you had to, but because it made sense, certainly at that time, and given the issues we were looking at then. And for the transcript, those oh, were... Oh, and I'm sorry, could I yes. add something to that, because I realised that this, that, could, that statement could be really open to interpretation. When I say move forward together, that means discussing, sharing thoughts, <clears throat> not a kind of no surprises approach, in a sense, with each other. It doesn't mean to say that you're ever bound to either party's direction of travel, but you at least work through that thinking process together. And if you think you then can work together on delivering something, you do that too. Uh, and for the transcript, the references to the um, communications and discussions I um, uh, mentioned earlier are SCGV 40174 underscore 068, um, DHSC 0038520 underscore 109 and SCGV 40247 underscore 036. Uh, I'm going to move on to um, a different topic now um, and it's um, in relation to the consequences in Scotland to the decision that was handed down by Mr Justice Burton in the Hepatitis C litigation in March 2001. Um, I'm going to pick it up uh, in a uh, submission that you made to the Cabinet on the 6th of June 2001, once you'd reached your decision uh, about what you were suggesting um, Scotland should do. And we find that at SCGV 40243 underscore 156. So we can see uh, oh, it's the 15th of June, I don't know why I said the 6th of June, but Friday the 15th of June 2001, for decision for the Scottish Cabinet, purpose to invite Cabinet to endorse a course of action regarding compensation for people who have been infected with hepatitis C as a result of receiving blood or blood components from the National Health Service in Scotland. 
This course of action takes account of the recent English High Court judgment clarifying the law in this area. And then you set out the background to the, uh, uh, Mr Justice Burton's judgment. And then at five, it says this, the inevitable consequence of this is that we cannot avoid the immediate financial consequences of settling legally valid actions already raised under CPA. And just pausing there, th this comes after you had got legal advice from counsel uh, and uh, we don't need to go to that, but for the transcripts, it's SCGV 40243 underscore 161. And that's what you're reflecting there in, in paragraph five. Uh, and then if we go over the page, you set out your course of action that you recommend. Um, and if we can pick it up at um, five bullet po points down, uh, you're setting out what you've borne in mind. Uh, and then you say, while we sympathize with individuals affected, we also have to recognize that any compensation payment which we make, which is not in connection with a legitimate action raised under the CPA, will make it virtually impossible in the future to maintain the general principle of not paying compensation for non-negligent harm. Each <coughs> new special case erodes that principle. And then any out-of-court payment would be a compassionate move by government, uh, but is likely to be used by pressure groups, the media and interested MSPs, to argue for the principle of compensation to be extended. And then if we go down to uh, paragraph 8... I also considered various other options, such as hardship funds, a public inquiry, and a no-fault compensation for people affected before the inception of CPA. However, my strong view, supported by legal advice, is to settle only those cases which are exactly analogous with the English judgment, i.e. those where the claimant received blood or blood components contaminated with hepatitis C virus after 1st March 1988 and has raised an action under... CPA, which is not time barred or likely to be allowed by courts, even if it is time barred. Uh, and then paragraph nine, any other course of action would establish a new policy on non-negligent compensation that would have far-reaching consequences in the future. We would need time to consider this very carefully in consultation with the other UK administrations. And then you set out at paragraph 10 uh, your recommended course of action. Well, my recommended course of action does not conflict with previous government policy, etc., and then removes the need for genuine claimants to fight their case through the courts, although it is possible that some claimants will decline to settle on reasonable terms, in which case we shall face one or more court cases anyway, and then you go on to set out other um, consequences of your decision. So we can see here you are weighing up on the one hand um, the, the, pros and, the pros and cons of, of the consequences of the judgment, saying, on the one hand, if we pay beyond what, uh, the, beyond those cases that would succeed under the judgment, if it applies in Scotland, um, that would set a, a precedent. Um, and then you've considered, on the other hand, the um, uh, co no fo uh, the, uh, a compensation scheme, uh, and, you, and you're balancing that out in, in, in this in this paper for the cabinet. Is that the right way to understand what you're doing here? I don't think I would substantively um, disagree with with your summary there. I suppose what I would add to it is this was one of a lot of deliberations. This specific paper came about because of the specific ruling in these particular cases. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me, but 20 years, 20 years on, and you know, on these detailed legal matters, I remember us spending so much time really looking at them, understanding them, thinking about the implications. And by the way, by then, on this case, we weren't just thinking about matters to do with blood or blood products. There was additional concerns, now the Consumer Protection Act had come into play, that that might further impact on other aspects of NHS practice and products and so on. So you were into a whole other array of considerations about what might the implications of this judgment be. 
But as I say, 20 plus years on, and given um, the time that we spent on some of the detail of these matters at the time, and as you say, we sought council opinion. There's a, a paper on record which Martin Chisholm and myself were both at, uh, sorry, a note of a meeting that we were both at, where that council, uh, uh, we, where that was discussed with the QC in question and so on. I, I wouldn't trust myself 20 years on to really talk about much technical detail here, to be honest, um, because I almost certainly would be imprecise and inaccurate, and particularly on matters of law. I'm very wary about that, for the reason that I hope you'll appreciate. I suppose I would make just, just a couple of points, really. One, that point about the... Sort of mental somersaults at times that, that I think many of us were going through as to how we could try and do something, do the right thing for um, both for people who had been affected by in, infected blood and blood products, primarily obviously we've been considering issues relating to haemophiliacs, but as we all know there were others too. But also more widely than that, what, what any of this would mean for, for an NHS that was where we, we, we did the right thing and the best thing for, for all the people that, that depend on it. So we, as I say, we went round and round and round on these issues. And as I say, I'd leave that paper to stand in terms of that particular issue. The only other thing I would add, and I know that the inquiry has taken an interest in the question of advice, I also, and I don't know if this is ever this is written down anywhere, and for all that I've studied public policy for years, it maybe the opposite is written down somewhere, but in my head, as an elected politician, as a minister during that period, there is a kind of hierarchy of advice. Um, probably at the bottom, but not in a disrespectful sense, is policy advice. That's the space where, as a minister, you can push in quite hard and argue the toss and, you know, think about different ways of doing things. There's then, in the case of a health minister, medical advice or other, I would say, specialist advice. And particularly in areas of health and public health and so on, you tread with great caution. I think when you start to question bona fide clinical advice. And probably alongside that, I don't think I'd go so far as to decide between lawyers and doctors, but, but, but you know, alongside that, there's legal advice, and certainly particularly when you get to stage of taking like council opinion and so on. And I just note that because sometimes that thing about advice, what advice did you get, what advice did you follow, you know, is, is a very, and I understand why, a very, very important concern to understand how and why ministers take decisions. But there's multiple types of advice, multiple sources of advice, different levels of weight that you have to give to different types of advice. And at the end of the day, you're held to account for how you balance all of that together and come out the other end. Um, so yes, this was this was another development um, in the the continued evolution, if you like, of some of the legal precedents and and outcomes of certain you know litigation processes that were developing in different parts of the UK, but it sat in that much wider tapestry and all the, that range of advice and opinion that was coming towards us. So my question is in relation to the precedent point, and it, it, it's this. Why would making payments to those who have received um, a defective product, so infected blood as a result of the, the judgment, um, lead to a general principle uh, to... Um, pay compensation for non-negligent harm. So if we look back at the, at the paper that we've that just been looking at, it, it's the bullet point that says, while we sympathise with individuals affected, so about a third of the way down. While we sympathise with individuals affected, Affected. We ha also have to recognise that any compensation payment which we make, which is not in connection with a legitimate action raised under the CPA. So I understand that to mean if you were to pay those that have been infected before the 1st of March 1988, so before the Consumer Protection Act came into force, uh, 
the rationale seems to be it will make it virtually impossible in the future to maintain the general principle of not paying compensation for non-negligent harm. And my question to you is why, why was that the view that was taken? Where it, if, if those people had received a defective product? So, the two aspects to this, I think, um, from where I'm sitting now and then, I think what comes through there is that we are still returning to that general principle. I, I know that this is, you know, contested to, to, today, and especially in this room, but, but, you know, we are keeping coming back to, we have to stick to a general principle here. The, and that, sorry, just to repeat the full words, the general principle of not paying compensation for non-negligent harm. The challenge in the question and the deliberations in so many rooms and over so much time was, how do you help people that have been affected as a consequence of, in consequence of infected blood and blood products and maintain that principle? And this was another development where, and this is, this is where I, I don't want to comment on the technicalities, I don't feel equipped to do that um, all these years on. You know, this was another process of advice and recommendation that, that said, if, all, if, if we were to stick to that general principle, here's how it applies in this case. And I, 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 I genuinely and sincerely hope that this inquiry, you know, because if anybody can do it, I think, you know, you can, given, you know, the, the extent to which you've looked across, you know, the sort of policy issues, but also the technical issues and the legal issues and, and all, all of those matters, then, you know, I think if we can get progress, not just for haemophiliacs and others that have been affected through infected blood, but frankly others, others for the future, progress to, to you know, get some greater clarity and definition about how you deal with harm, whether it's fault-based harm or, or, or not, um, for people that have clearly had an adverse experience, then, you know, I think it would be great if we could, you know, could get better clarity and definition around that. At that point in time, we were still, as I say, going round and round and round trying to work out how to marry together. Maybe what many of us would feel um, the need or desire to do, but equally had to marry it together with, you know, that, that wider framework we were working within. Given where we were at the time, as I say, yes, I know there's been lots of further development and thinking and discussion and people pushed into that and tried with varying degrees of success to take different decisions, you know, and it's not undermining that principle. I understand all of that. I'm just saying at that moment in time, we were still working round and round that. So having taken the decision to only pay what's been termed analogous cases... I just want to ask you um, a, a few questions about what your expectation was as to how that would play out. Um, was it your expectation that those cases that had been issued and that were analog analogous uh, uh, would be identified and um, negotiations started for, to see whether settlement was possible? I don't think I can comment beyond what, what, what's in the paper. And, and there was a lengthy public statement that I made to Parliament and all of this, and I think I would just point towards that. Um, because I think, well, certainly, I don't think I can talk about expectations and, and the likes back at that point in time. I think it, I can only turn to myself what was actually recorded and communicated at the time. And were you kept up to date at all about what steps were taken? <laughs> Again, I, I don't recall how much we, we were told at the time, but I've seen additional papers now from that period that, you know, is about some of that process working through. And to be honest, there was nothing there. There are other things that I've seen during the inquiry that I, I may have sort of raised my eyebrows at, but, but 
in this instance, you know, the cabinet, and it wasn't just me by this stage, the cabinet had taken a decision and it was for officials to, to take that forward and apply it. And ministers wouldn't be involved in things like legal settlements and, and so forth. We'd set the policy framework. So the policy framework, expect the officials to get on and do it and not expect them to report back to you or not necessarily? Not if they're acting within the, the letter and the spirit of, of, of what a full cabinet um, discussion has, and paper has decided. Um, yeah. um, I, I'm going to turn now to uh, the last topic that I'm going to ask you questions about, and it is uh, the topic that we've, we've trailed, I think, all day, and that's the question of public inquiry. Mm. Um, my question to you is, is, is very simple. Um, why did you not make a decision to have a public inquiry? So I said earlier when we touched on this, I wanted to make a distinction between a statutory public inquiry and some other form of independent investigation. Um, and on that latter point, incidentally, as I say, that's not a label that I ascribed to the piece of work that I did commission. That was a fact-finding exercise. I'm talking about some other form of bigger, wider, independent investigation. Um, so on a statutory public inquiry, um, having said publicly and again now that I wanted to move into the issues involved here with an open mind and hear people's views and so on, there is one area where I did have a clear and firm view from the outset and it never moved, and that was on the issue of a statutory public inquiry. And I said that when I met with the Haemophilia Society, said it in subsequent correspondence, and I'd like to just explain now why um, that was the case and what my rationale was, because I've heard others come since and give a very different rationale, certainly what mine was at that point in time. Um, so if I talk about public inquiries in general, at the beginning of devolution, there have been very, very few Scottish public inquiries. I mean, most notably, we'd had the work of Lord Cullen around Piper Alpha disaster and the Dunblane shootings. Um, but very, very few Scottish public inquiries. Some other judge-led inquiries, but, but you know, not public inquiries as we would recognise them um, for the purposes of the discussion today. Um, so there was already you know, quite a high bar there for anything that you would do in that space in Scotland. Um, secondly, any public inquiry at any time necessarily takes time to establish, many years to hold, and considerable, considerable resource um, to deliver. That's not a reason for not having a public inquiry, but it is just a statement of fact. And at the beginning of devolution, we had no idea where public inquiries would even sit in the new way that we were going to be working. Um, as I've mentioned already, you know, we had this entire new parliament in place with this committee system that now, like so much at the beginning of devolution, hopes and expectations and optimism far outweighed what was outstripped, what was ever going to be deliverable, it has to be said. But at that point in time, we had huge expectations for how the parliament would become this and its committees would become the space through which there would be open inquiry and so on. And, and this is me still in the gen generic space about a public inquiry in Scotland in that first year or two of devolution. Um, the other issue, I think, was um, in this and in many other areas, I think I and my ministerial colleagues were very aware of the fact that anything we did, particularly in that first year, um, I say a year, but you know, year or two, that very early period, but anything that we did for the first time was a precedent by definition. And there were many other demands for public inquiries. When I say demands, well, I'll give an example that I think maybe you, you want to touch on, but you know, one, another very complex and sensitive issue that I dealt with during my time as minister was the experience of bereaved parents whose children's organs had been retained without consent. And, for example, they began at the beginning of that process in having a, a demand for a public inquiry. Now, in that case, we managed to find a way where we could work through things within the context of devolution in a way that achieved far quicker, better resolution and in a way that moved forward. And I think our mindsets at that time 
was very much to try and find ways within the powers and processes that we had where you could make real and practical difference to resolve issues for people and make progress with people. And in that particular instance, I remember one of the parents being quoted publicly saying, I'm really pleased we didn't have a public inquiry because we've managed to, to move forward much better than, than we would have done through that means. So for me, in a generic sense, if I can put it that way, I, I cannot envisage circumstances in those first few years of devolution where I would have reached for a, a, a public inquiry as a means to progress an issue. When I say progress, I mean investigate, inquire, bring forward answers, you know, learn lessons for the future, that whole area. I cannot think of a situation where I would have, would, would have done that for a whole host of these different reasons. And I suspect my, my colleagues would have been in exactly the same place for the same reason. And it was many, many years later, actually, before public inquiries became um, more common in Scotland. And there's been become even more common just in, in the recent period. And I've seen ministers of different political hues over the years. Um, you know, re-articulate some of what I've said there. So that's the, that's the generality about a public inquiry. And then if I could turn to how, for me, and my whole background and work, and before I became a politician and since, you know, is, is kind of in the space of trying to think about how do you get the right facts and the right process in place to get, you know, a fair and reasonable result and outcome for people. Because if you mismatch the problem with the process, then it doesn't, it doesn't move you forward. So, so if those were my general concerns about a public inquiry, as far as looking at infected blood issues were concerned, the more I looked at this, I touched on this earlier, the complexity of the issues involved here and the degree to which they, they took place before devolution and the extent to which they involved a complexity of UK-wide issues for me, you know, even if I hadn't had that as a starting point about public inquiries in a more generous, general sense, for me that absolutely tipped the balance that we could not move this issue forward through that vehicle. I understand why people would ask for it, although interestingly, there was a lot of different demands at that time, or different phrases even, both in the Parliament and even some of the campaign materials about independent examinations, public inquiries and so on. But as far as the bona fide public inquiry was concerned, that, for me, was not going to be the way forward in Scotland. And I think some of the concerns that I've just articulated there, you know, were illustrated or evidenced by some of the experience with Penrose. I don't want to say any more than that. Um, on the other hand, or along, alongside that perhaps, I didn't have a closed mind about other forms of independent examination. And the experience that we had around... Um, children's organs retention, for, I, I gave as an example of this, um, where we did manage to move things on through that type of uh, well, process. I um, had several strands to it, in fact. Um, I, I, I say this openly and honestly, I could not see at, that, at the point in time, for the duration of that two and a half years that I was there, which you know, isn't very long in the span of time, but it, it was a significant period and there was a great deal um, changing in the whole way we were working in Scotland. And in that period in time, I, I couldn't see what the parameters of an independent examination would be and what the means would be through which we could take this forward. The potential, I actually, wouldn't even just end up in an even worse kind of um, complicated uh, confusion of issues that that very small exercise that I, I had taken forward did. And I, I was very, very keen to ensure that if there was going to be any other work done, particularly in looking back to what had happened in the pre-devolution period, you had to be confident and clear that it could be done and done properly and well. And I, I think, don't, I won't say, I won't say with certainty what exactly was in my head then, but certainly looking back, now, um, I think you could only ever do that on a UK basis apart from anything else, whatever, whatever process you put in place. So ju just so that I can understand your evidence because you've given, because you've been asked this question various times during the day yep. um, at different times, but is, is this a fair way to um, not summarise but, but 
crystallise what you've said. I, I think you, you said that as a result of that internal investigation that there were lots of questions that were left unanswered and that talked about the multiplicity and the complexity of the issues that had been raised with you at that stage. And you've also told us that you saw that as the beginning of a progression or, the, or part of a process. And then is it fair to understand what you've just told us is that while you didn't think that the next stage in that process was a public inquiry, you didn't actually know what the next stage would be? Yeah, there was a next stage evolving, as we've discussed, around these payment issues because of the committee report. But in terms of wider forms of investigation and inquiry, um, I, I hadn't worked that out. And I, I wasn't bad sometimes at being able to work out a way through complex and difficult issues. But that, that yeah. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that. So those are the questions that I had from Ms Deacon. Yes, well, you, you want to uh, take a moment or two to inquire of core participants what questions they may, they may have. Let me explain, uh, Ms Deacon. Um, the inquiry is, uh, in large in statute, a collaborative exercise between core participants and the inquiry team. Uh, and core participants play a valuable role. Part of that uh, is, through their recognised legal representatives, putting questions through counsel to the inquiry to a witness uh, about the evidence which that witness has given. Plainly, they can't really finalise that until they've heard everything you've had to say, uh, and we have to give them a reasonable time to do that. So um, what would you suggest? Uh, about um, uh, no, half an hour or so? I, I would have said uh, not, not before half an hour, certainly. Not before. Very well. Well, let's... Um, I, I'll use the formula not before because it means that uh, it may be a little bit later. I can't tell you how long it'll be. Um, you'll be told if it's any later than half past four. Ah, but yes, half past three. <laughs> uh, just as well I corrected myself. Uh, uh, any later than half past three. Um, uh, and you will too, of course. And I can't tell you how long you'll be kept after that. It depends how many questions uh, there are and, and how long uh, an answer they, they deserve. Uh, so half past three.